So we're here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we'll pick up in verse 1. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Isn't that good right there? God that comforteth those that are cast down. Amen. You ever needed that? God comforts us. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Let's pray. Lord, help me, please. I pray I can make this clear and it can be a help to us here. Every one of us needs this, God. This isn't just for one person. It's for all of us. We need many times to come to you in repentance, and, and we need to see what it looks like, God, so we know if we truly are repentant. God, help us, please, to take this to heart and that we'd cement it in our hearts, Lord, and this is how we would truly want to turn to you when we've done wrong. That this is what our life would look like and be characterized by. None of us is perfect, God, we know that. But Lord, help us be teachable and correctable. Please. Amen. It starts off in verse 1, he says, Having therefore these promises. What promises is it talking about? We go to the previous chapter, and verse 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And what does he say if we've done that? So these are the promises. He says, if you come out from among them, if you separate yourself. Amazing how we see it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. My goodness, God must think it's pretty important for us to live a separated life. But he says, if you've done this, if you touch not the unclean thing, he says, I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So having, therefore, these promises, so this promise that God will receive us and he'll be a father unto us, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. The filthiness of the flesh are those things we do outwardly. The the actual sinful acts that we go and commit. And the lusts of the flesh, many times it's encompassed by, and it talks about, you know, adultery, fornication, um, uncleanness, these types of things, the lusts of the flesh, what my flesh actually goes out and does, drunkenness. I mean, those types of things. But the, it talks about that. It says we need to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. But get this, the spirit can be filthy too. The spirit can be filthy too. We're to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. So what's the spirit? It's those things internal that no one sees. That nobody knows the lust, the envy, the lying, the deceit, the anger, the hatred, the inner rebellion, the lusts of the spirit. We need to cleanse ourselves of those things. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That fear of God's going to come back up here as we look at these characteristics necessary or as a fruit of repentance. Paul's writing them this letter, and he he goes through. I'm going to skip some. He says in verse 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. What's he talking about right there? He's talking about the letter of 1 Corinthians. There were some issues they needed to deal with, and one in particular which was heinous and completely wicked. 
And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you at one point want to go back and get the background of what's going on right here and what Paul is talking about. But it's this man, he has his father's wife. He's having an affair with his father's wife. Every uh, commentator I've read says that it's his stepmother, but I don't think the Bible necessarily makes that to be the distinction. It's likely that's what it is, but the Bible doesn't say that's what it is. It says he has his father's wife. It could have been his own mother, for all we know, because Paul says that you're committing a sin that's not even named among the Gentiles. He says, this is so bad, the wicked lost world doesn't even tolerate this stuff, and you guys have allowed it in your church? So it could have been his stepmother, which is what most everyone wants to assume. See, that's the problem with mankind is we always want to assume the best. Even in the most wicked sin, we always want to assume the best. And that very may way be. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's what it is. That may be what's happened. But it very well could also be that he's having an affair with his own mother. I don't know. It's bad either way. Either way, whatever it is, it's wickedness. And everybody knew about it. So that's what's going on right here. This is what Paul's writing them about. And he says that, for though I made you sorry with a letter, he says, I, I made you sorry in sending you that letter. I do not repent. He says, I'm not changing my mind that I sent it to you. I think it's a good thing. But he says this, though I did repent. Though when I first sent it, he says, I did repent. I was thinking, should I have sent this to him? Was it too harsh? Did I tell him too much? I mean, he came out on a bunch of things right there. He was hitting them with it and told them, you can't do this. You've got to fix this thing. And he says, I did repent. He says, I was having second thoughts. I mean, this is divine inspiration right here, what we're reading. And Paul's giving us his thought process in sending 1 Corinthians. I mean, I, probably when he was writing, he's like, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't send this. Maybe I should just hold on to this one. Maybe I should go there in person first. He told them I'm going to go there. But he's th he, these things are going through his mind, and he's thinking, should I or shouldn't I? He says, I do not repent, though I did repent. He says, uh, at, at one point I thought I never should have sent that letter. Great. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. See, and we're all, all this is leading up to, to repentance. And specifically, verse 10 says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. This fits, the, the same, what we're going to look at here is the same thing a lost person has to do, but it's the same thing a saved person has to do. Repentance is the same in either case. It's just, you know, the end result's kind of different because you're going after salvation first, but it doesn't change for salvation. You're still going after God. You're still turning to God. It's still the same thing, but the, the steps and the process is the same exact thing. Nothing changes, and it should have the same fruit either way. And this is something that you need as a Christian. You need it for the rest of your life. You need this type of repentance. So he says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. But when we look at it in the full context, this is speaking about saved people, okay, that profess Christ. I mean, these are believers in this church in Corinth. Paul's writing to them and he's saying, this is what you need. This is the repentance that you need. I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. And if we understand as we're leading up to repentance, uh, part of it is that leading to it is there's going to be sorry or sorrow, and it may be there for a season. Because we're so dumb. Can I say that in the nicest possible way? That God sometimes has to just break us down. And we fight Him and fight Him and fight Him. So God says, it may be for a season that you're feeling sorry and you're just fighting me. And we won't give it over to Him. We keep persisting in our way and this feeling of sorriness or sorrow is all over us because we won't give in to God. That's what Paul's saying happened right here, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner. He says, now that I heard from Titus, I sent Titus to you. He said, I had to know. I couldn't wait any longer. And I was stuck where I was at, so I sent Titus to you. And Titus came back and he says, now I rejoice. Because the report came back that they got things right. And praise God. Amen. Can I tell you, that's the weight of every preacher. Amen. Is, well, I get up and say some things sometimes and I don't want to. I don't enjoy saying it. And sometimes I leave here and I think, should I have even said that? Man, I wish I didn't say that. I wish I wouldn't have said that, maybe. And then I, I see the change. 
And I rejoice. And maybe I'm glad I said that. Maybe it's a good thing I said that. And I rejoice over it. But that's the weight of every preacher. If he's doing what God wants. If he's preaching the truth of God's word. Again, repentance is something that a, someone coming to salvation needs to deal with and a saved person. And as we come through this series on the family, each of us needs to have the attitude that we want God to reveal our personal sin to us and that we'll find true repentance. Can we just stop here for a second and, and pray to God and say, God, show me what I'm doing wrong. Show me where I need to change. If we all had that attitude, there's no telling what the Lord could do. That's when we just open the door of revival. But that means there needs to be a confession of sin. We're not defending it. We're just being done with it. We're sick of it. Let's take a minute and pray that right now. Father, I do ask you come before each of us and that each of us would have the heart to truly want to follow you and quit our sin. And God, that you would reveal to each of us as individuals what we're doing wrong, what we need to fix. God, please show us. Help us. Give us the strength to do right, Lord. Help us not focus on others and what we think they need, but Lord, help us get the beam out of our own eye and get ourselves right with you, please. Amen. To obey what we're told in verse 1 and to have revival in our church, there has to be a self-examination. To cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, there has to be a self-examination. Again, not an examination of other people's sins, but of your own. That's not easy to do. I mean, if, we get, if you get down to business and you're sincere, turn to Psalm 139 if you would, please. If you get down to business and you're sincere in what you need to do and what you're asking God, it is not going to be easy. This is what the psalmist said in Psalm 139, verse 23. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. If you're sincere in praying that, that's not an easy prayer to pray. Our own heart will deceive us. And it even scares me to, to pray that and say, God, show me what I'm doing wrong. Because there may be some things I think I'm doing great in, and God's like, nah, uh nah, -uh, you're way off. And I fear that. But do we, do we fear God more, and do we desire following after righteousness more, and walking where God wants us more than we fear God revealing our own wicked hearts to us? That's how we need to come to God. We need to come to Him like that, and asking Him those things. And in all sincerity, that's how we need to approach Him. That's not easy to do. I mean, you may not even right now. You may have to go home and think about this and pray about this. And look, can I just say, this is why we have an invitation at the end of the service. It's so right then you can make a decision. You can come down and talk to God about it. And you can kill what needs to be killed and leave it on this altar up here. That's why we have that. It's not so you can just, you know, we can just close our eyes and pray at the end of a service and play some music at the end. No, it's so you can deal with what God's been dealing with you about, so you can leave that with Him. But this may be something that we honestly have to go home and say, I don't know if I can honestly pray, pray that prayer. I don't know if I can honestly even ask God to search me and show me and reveal any wicked way in me. I don't know that I want to do that. And again, if, if that's what your heart is saying, then you need to ask yourself, why? Why? And I'm telling you, here's what it's going to go back to. I'll tell you right now, here's what it'll go back to. Egypt. Egypt. You think, what are you talking about, preacher? You've given your heart to the world. Amen. You've given your heart to the world and not to God. We've got to want to get honest. Honest with ourselves, honest with God. That's what true repentance is going is to do. 
True repentance involves confession. And, and true confession means the, all the excuses are gone. I am naked before God with all my sin out there in front of me and I'm not defending it. I have no defense. None whatsoever. I've laid it all out before God. Now I may have a defense before others in that I got things right. This is my defense. I did wicked, but look at what I'm doing. That's my defense before others. We'll talk about that. Probably this evening, because I doubt I'm getting to it today, this morning. But we have no defense before God, no excuses. We're not trying to justify sin. That's what it means. That's what confession means. I'm just, I'm done with it. God, you're right, I'm wrong. And we say it, but I'm telling you, that's what confession is. It's not, well, but. I'm sorry I did that, God, but. It's none of that. Then you're not really repentant. You're not confessing. You, you, you don't truly think that you did wrong. You don't. And our pride's what stops us from that. Our pride says, no, I'm not that bad. We talk about the lost people we go talk to, how they, oh, they don't ever want to admit they're sinners. They don't want to see themselves as God sees them. Man, I'm talking, saved people don't want to see themselves as God sees them. Saved people don't want to look at it like that. I'm not that bad. I go to church every Sunday. What are you telling me? Show me your Facebook. Show me your Instagram. Show me your Pinterest, your Snapchat. Show me that stuff. Is Snapchat the one where the pictures disappear? Right? That's some wickedness right there. The devil thought that one up. I'll tell you right now. The devil thought that junk up. The devil thought that up. Why? Because I can shoot stuff to my friends and it disappears and my parents can't see it. My wife can't see it. My husband can't see it. Is that, yeah, it looks like a ghost to me is what it looks like. Yeah, it's just a devil. See, show me that stuff. You afraid? You, will you, hey, will you just show your parents, open up everything for them? Let them see it? Open up everything for your wife? My wife can come at any time. At any time and grab my phone and look at anything she wants to on this. On my computer. I told you I have some internet software that, that uh, alerts her if I look at anything pornographic or anything like that. Even, it doesn't have to be pornographic. It could just be uh, just even just evil. If it's mature content, there's different settings you could put. But every month, she gets a report emailed to her about what I've been looking at on the internet. Every month. Why? Because I don't trust myself. Amen. I don't trust myself. What, Pastor? That's right. My own heart can deceive me. My own heart can lie to me. And I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm too weak. I'm too weak. And I can do the same thing with hers anytime I want. I can grab it and look at whatever I want. I have nothing to hide from her. She can look at it anytime she wants. Could I walk up and, and grab your phone? I wouldn't do that. But could I? And would you? Would your heart start going? What's he gonna see? What's he gonna find? What's he gonna? Look? I hope he doesn't turn to that one. Would would that be your heart? You're like no, because it's on Snapchat and it disappeared. Okay, all right. Go ahead, Pastor. Here you go. All right. Let me hold your phone for a day, without you contacting any of your friends or anything like that. And let's see what shows up. Hmm. See, I'm not gonna do that. But you know who does see it all? The Lord. The Lord. The Lord sees it all. So you see, I'm done with the excuses. Confession is, I'm not, I'm, it it doesn't mean you need to come to any person and confess to them. That, That may be involved. You may need to do that. That may be part of it. But it doesn't mean you have to. Because we've sinned against God. And we come to God and confess before Him. If we're not willing to admit that what we've done is wrong, even with our our attitudes, the wrong attitudes that we have, the wrong attitude you have towards your boss at work, you know, when you grovel about him, complain about him, "Ah, he does a sorry job. That wrong attitude, maybe he does do a sorry job, but you don't need to voice it. Just say, God, help him do a better job. Help me be a better employee. Help me do right because I serve you, Lord, not him. That attitude... 
We don't need to justify that. Try and excuse it. Justify a bad attitude towards our parents, an attitude of rebellion. Even as, as adults, an attitude of rebellion towards uh, our boss, maybe. Towards our husbands, ladies. Towards the Lord, men. I'm the man of this house, then you better act like it and lead like Jesus wants you to lead. Why don't you be kind to your wife? Be nice to your wife. Treat her like a queen. Love her. Cherish her. Take care of her. Protect her. It doesn't mean you always demand stuff. You get up and do the dishes. You get up and vacuum. You get up and do some of that stuff that you know she doesn't, that she just does without complaining. Hey, I'm guilty of all this stuff too. I don't just preach to you guys when I get up here. I mean, I'm guilty of all this stuff too. There has to be a self-examination. As we move forward in this series, there's everyone in here, all of us are going to have to do much repenting. And that's why this is where we're starting this series, is what does repentance look like? Each of us needs godly sorrow that brings about true repentance in our lives. Each and every one of us needs that. Godly sorrow that brings about true repentance in our lives. Paul lays out seven characteristics associated with true repentance, and that's what we are going to look at as we move forward this, uh, this morning and this evening. So what are the characteristics of repentance? Well, Before we get to those, we're going to first look at what leads to true repentance, and that's godly sorrow is what leads to true repentance. So let's go to 2 Corinthians 7 again. I know we were there in Psalms. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Godly sorrow is required to bring about true repentance. Verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, the selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. All right, I don't have time to get into the sorrow of the world that worketh death, but just to suffice it to say, just look at Judas. He had the sorrow of the world, okay? We're going to look at godly sorrow. That is necessary to bring about true repentance. Godly sorrow is sorrowing over our sin because we see it as God does and no longer like man sees it or the devil. Okay, we see our sin how God sees it. Paul talked about in Romans that our sin might be exceeding sinful. That little lie you told might be exceeding sinful. More than just what we think it is. I didn't murder anybody. I'm not a murderer. You're just a stinking wicked liar. See, that it would be exceeding sinful. It's just a little lust. It's just a little hatred. It's just a little rebellion. Exceeding sinful. This is how we have to see our sin if we're to be truly repentant. If we don't see it like God sees it, there's no repentance. Repentance isn't going to happen. And for us to see it like God sees it, that's what's going to help bring about that godly sorrow. Remember now at Corinth here, the, the, this church, the people involved there were permitting a man who would commit adultery with either his mother or his stepmother. They were permitting him to remain in the church. They were allowing this and they all knew it. That's what they were allowing to go on. And I'm telling, look, just as we, Lord willing, nothing like that ever happens here. But people being people, there will likely come a day we have to exercise church discipline and kick someone out of this assembly. I don't ever want that to happen. I never want to come to that. Never. Never, ever. And God, if you can, please spare us from that. Don't ever let us have to do that. But God, if we need to, I pray we would. I pray that we would. We wouldn't allow that. We wouldn't tolerate that. We have to see our sin as God sees it. We have to be broken over it. It says there that, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner. See that, that sorrow and sorry, it's equated, it's the same thing. You sorrowed after a godly manner. We have to be broken over our sin. Sorrow is defined like this. A feeling of sadness or grief caused especially by the loss of someone or something. Deep distress, sadness, or regret. This is how we ought to be over our sin. I'm telling you to the point of, you ever lost somebody that you loved and it just hurts? Someone dies in your family and it's just like a weight on you? 
feels like there's just a hundred pound weight on your chest and it hurts. This is how we ought to be broken over our sin. Godly sorrow. Deep regret. Deep distress. Grief. We grieve when we lose someone we love. A feeling of sadness or grief caused especially by the loss of someone or something. The loss of something the Corinthians were experiencing was their closeness to the Lord. That's what they'd lost. By the way, when we want to harbor our sin and hold on to it, that's what we've lost. Does that bother us? Does it bother you when you're not close to God? It bothers me when I'm not close to the Lord. When I'm just not walking with Him like I should. When I'm holding on to sin like I shouldn't, I hate it. And then when I get things right and I get back to close with Him, I'm saying, God, why do I ever leave this? Why do I ever go away from this? I love this. Why do I do that? That's the deceitfulness of sin. That's how it'll lie to us and deceive us. Godly sorrow brought them to genuine repentance, which equated to a complete change of action. Their godly sorrow brought them to repentance. I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. He said, godly sorrow worketh repentance, verse 10, to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing, what? That you sorrowed after a godly sort. That's what it was, and, and it brought about these characteristics that we're going to look at. But godly sorrow brought them to genuine, genuine repentance, which equated to a complete change of their action. How'd they change their action? What did they do? The, the reason why Paul was rejoicing, because Titus came and brought them good news about their repentance, and he's saying, this is the stuff that was there that was evident, because you repented. The change was that they did what they needed to do. They kicked this man out of the church. They did it. They did what Paul said. They did the right thing. And Paul said it led to action. And all repentance will. You look through repentance throughout the whole Bible, and you're going to see it's a change of mind that always leads to a change of action. I don't care if it's God repenting or man repenting. Every time, it's a change of mind that leads to a change of action. So if you've truly repented, you're going to have a change of mind about sin, about self, about God. You're going to have a change of mind about all of that that leads to a change of action. There's going to be a turning. You're going to turn from that sin. And it doesn't mean that you won't turn back to it, but I'm saying if there's real repentance, you're going to turn from it. It doesn't mean you're not going to stumble and fall and may go back to it, but true repentance means you're going to turn from it and there'll be a change of action. You're saying, I don't want that anymore. Well, you're repentant. Your heart is yearning and longing for the Lord, not your sin. Okay, now again, I want us to understand that we all have our flesh, and our flesh is going to be pulling back this way. That flesh is strong. I mean, I gave, you know, 21 years of my life to my flesh, giving it whatever it wanted. Most of us have lived like that. That's why we got to die to self. And the flesh is strong, and it's going to pull us this way towards the devil and the world, Egypt, however we want to liken it. But we've got to repent. We've got to turn and go towards God and run to God. God said, draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. I'm right here. I haven't left. You walked away from me. God says, come back, and I'll go to you. He's got bigger steps than us, by the way. Amen, right there. That's good. God's got bigger steps. Even for a safe person, when we're truly repentant, there's going to be a noticeable change of action. It may only be noticeable to the individual because it's a struggle we've had on the inside, but it's going to be there. It doesn't always mean that someone else is going to see it if, if, if it's a, uh, the filthiness of the Spirit. It may eventually come out, but immediately it might not. Because it's something you've been struggling with internally. Something you've been fighting in here. And the way it may exhibit itself outwardly is just a joy comes over you. A peace comes over you. And no one can really say they're just, there's something different. They just seem happier. So I can't put my finger on it. But other people may not know. Now, if it's some outward action, people might see it. And they should. I mean, what happened in this instance of 1 Corinthians chapter 5? That was an outward experience. They could see these people got down to it they did what they needed to do and they kicked this man out that's what needed to happen everyone could see that 
But if you're dealing with like anger, anger issues or something on the inside, now that usually does express itself. People will see that. But first, you're going to be the first one to notice that because it's in here. And maybe before you blow up, you're fighting it in here. And no one sees that. And what will be noticed, and usually it's not by people outside, it's going to be by family. Family will be the ones that see something like that, uh, that, that you've repented of anger because they don't see the outbursts anymore. Or they're getting fewer and fewer. There will be a change though. This is what we're looking for in our lives. Sorrow of a godly sort that brings us closer to God, not the lusts of our flesh. We want what's going to bring us closer to God. Godly sorrow is going to glorify God and put Him first. That's what it's going to do. It's going to glorify God and put Him first. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Let me ask you this. If godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, what happens at salvation? When God gives us repentance and we come to salvation, what happens? Who do we get closer to? To God, right? Well, it's no different for a saved person. If we have godly sorrow that works repentance, it's going to put us closer to God. That's what we want. That's what we should desire. Is God, I want you. I want what you want. God, change my desires to be your desires. That's godly sorrow working repentance. It'll bring me closer to God. It'll put him first. He will be preeminent. He'll be number one. So Colossians 1.18 says, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. He might be first. Man, is God first in all things in your life? In your career? In your career? I've seen so many people leave a good church for a job. And I'm like, what church are you going to out there? Oh, I don't know. We'll find one. What? That's not Christ preeminent in all things. Sorry. Well, I'm in the military. You don't understand. That's not Christ preeminent in all things. Sorry. I can't give up my retirement. You don't understand. That's not Christ preeminent in all things. Sorry. Sorry, it's not. That's your job preeminent in all things. Guess what they've got? What do you call that? I'll give you an illustration. Here's what it is. Oh, they're bowing down to their job. That's what they're doing. Is Christ preeminent in all things in your life? The career path you're choosing right now, have you asked God? See, most of us don't. Most of us don't ask God, God, what do you want me to do with my life? What would you have me do? We just pick it and say, God, bless it. That's what we say. We pick what we want to do, and then we say, God, jump on board with me, because this is where I'm at. We're too scared to ask, God, what do you want me to do? God, is this what you want for me? He's not preeminent in all things. Why? Because there's no godly sorrow. Because we are holding on to our own selfish desires. Again, because it's all about us. Because we have a God of our own imagination that we've lifted up. we got to repent of that stuff. I'm telling you, we have to. See, God called the, the apostles, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That day, they quit their career. They quit the family business that day. And some people are unwilling to do that. I think God's called a lot of men to be preachers. I know God's called a lot of men to be preachers and they haven't answered. They said, no, I don't, I'm not willing to make that sacrifice. They've shot God down there. I'm not going to do it. That might mean heartache, struggle. I'm not going to do it. We live a comfortable life here, and I like it. Okay. Let's go back to Moses. He esteemed the riches of Christ, the reproach of Christ, I'm sorry, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. See, we are guilty of being so focused on the things of this life that we're not willing to put God and make Him preeminent in all things, preeminent in everything. God is not number one in our lives. I'm telling you, when he called the apostles, they quit their job. They quit. Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. He had nothing to offer them. Nothing. Physically speaking, humanly speaking, he had nothing. Ultimately, he had everything to offer them. 
But physically and humanly speaking, it was nothing. He told another, he said, hey, you want to follow me? They came running to him when he's performing all his miracles. Hey, Lord, I want to follow you. Jesus said, that is great. The Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. You better think twice. You better think twice if you want to follow me because I don't have anywhere to lay my own head. I'm homeless. You sure you want that? Think what? God's going to make me homeless? I didn't say that. But are you willing to follow him where he leads you? You willing to go where he leads you? I like Brother Hernandez. He always says, where he leads me, I will follow. What he feeds me, I will swallow. You willing to do that? Wherever God leads you? He said, but you don't understand the job I have. Maybe I do. Maybe I do. Is he preeminent in all things? See, godly sorrow will glorify God and put him first. Won't put self first. The first characteristic brought forth by true repentance is that it brings forth a carefulness. And you look at verse 11. We're going to be stuck in verse 11 now. We'll go to a bunch of other places in the Bible, but we're going to get these seven characteristics of repentance right out of verse 11. He says, For behold, this self same thing. What is this self same thing that he's talking about? That she sorrowed after a godly sort. So, this godly sorrow, this is what we're talking about right here. Why? Because verse 10 tells us godly sorrow worketh repentance. Okay, so this self-same thing, this godly sorrow that works repentance, that she sorrowed after a godly sort, what did it do? What carefulness it wrought in you. Carefulness. So the first characteristic brought forth by true repentance is that it bring, brings forth carefulness in you. Carefulness speaks of a concern or worry of thought for a matter. Concern for, for this issue, for what's going to happen with this. It points to thinking about what may be done about the situation. What can I do about this situation? Titus 3, eight says, These things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. They were thinking about maintaining good works. What? Those that have believed in God were paying attention to this. They were focused on this matter of maintaining good works. And that's what carefulness does. This repentance, it brought, it says, Yea, what carefulness. It wrought in you. It made this. It brought this forth in you that you were looking at this matter and you were thinking about what can we do about this situation. Again, you've already come to the point of confession. You've already said, God, this thing is is wicked and wrong. And now it's wrought carefulness in you. So what do I need to do to fix it? Not what can I do to get out of the trouble that I'm in. But God, what can I do to fix it? We need haste and diligence in dealing with the issue at hand. I mean, immediate. Take, let's take care of this thing. Immediately set about to attack the sin problem. And that's where I'm telling you right there, man. Bam, if we can just get on that thing right there and start labeling the things that we do as sin instead of excusing them as just some mistake I made or something like that. Give it a sin name. And that's what nobody wants to do. Nobody wants to name it sin. No one wants to do that, but we got to give it a sin name so we can attack it and see what does God say about it. So I I just did this to to help my family. No, you're you're dishonest and you're a liar. You're bearing false witness. Just call it what it is. Stop trying to excuse it and justify it. So many people, we were talking with a lady yesterday. Court and I were talking with a lady yesterday. And and Court's asking her. He did a good job going through the gospel with her too, man. I mean, he went through all of it. He did a good job. And he was asking her, have you ever uh, ever stolen something? She said, no, I've never stolen anything. And then uh, he, he went with it for a while, and then I, I, he needed some help, so I jumped in, and I kind of went back and, and backed up on some things. And, and I ended up get showing her how she has been a thief, how she has stolen. And she was like, oh, well, I've never seen it like that. Why? Because, see, we want to just say, oh, it's, I'm not that bad. And we as Christians do the same thing. We don't think it's just a little lie. I'm not really a liar. I'm not really a gossiper. I, mean, I don't really do that. It's a prayer request. You know, that's a, we got a prayer request. Oh, come on, tell me, tell me, tell me. What is it? I don't gossip. You sure you're not gnawing on somebody's back? What are you talking about? The Bible calls it backbiting. Biting someone's back. You're talking behind, about them behind their back. Say, oh, I, I don't do that. I'm not a gossip. I'm not a backbiter. I'm just concerned. Okay, is that how God sees it? Or are we justifying our sin? Justifying our sin. 
Set about to attack the sin problem. Make it a lasting solution. Set forth a plan that won't leave you vulnerable to fall again. Ephesians 4.27 says, Neither give place to the devil. Don't give him an opportunity to get back in. See, so often that's what we do. There will be genuine repentance. And there'll be a desire, I want to do right. But we don't really make a lasting solution. We make a temporal solution. We, we, we just were very foolish in the way we handle things. We, 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 we say, get out, devil, boom! We kick him out and then we just leave the door open. We kicked him out, but as soon as we turn our back, the sly dog he is as a serpent, he just slithers his way back in. We give place to the devil because we don't make a lasting plan. I'm telling you, that internet accountability, that's a lasting plan. Okay, that's just something I've done. I, I don't want that for my whole family. And we, we failed in that area. But we put something in place so that we, it helps us not to. What have we done? We, we've gotten rid of entertainment that's wicked. And we don't give it to someone else. I destroy it. What about all the money? I destroy it. I destroy it so it's useless to anybody else. I've thrown away hundreds of dollars worth of DVDs. I don't know how much. It might be more than that. And destroyed them. I don't just throw them in the trash. I mean, I have a pair of pliers and I'm just <laughs> snapping all of them. <laughs> Someone will get all happy. The dumpster divers. They'll look at all these DVDs and they're like, well, who would do this? Destroyed them. I don't want anyone else partaking of that. Not on my account. Destroy it. So what is it? Well, I'll just put it away and we won't look at it. No, that's keeping the door open. That's me giving place to the devil. I don't want to do that. What carefulness it wrought in you. I'm being careful. I'm not going to give it an opportunity to come back and get me, come back and bite me. No thanks. Got a vicious dog. I mean, we, we had a, a, a dog that almost ate Desiree's face off when she was like a year and a half old. I mean, I, I'm serious. I, I saved her probably by that much. I mean, the dog was that close to just snapping right on her face. And I caught the dog. I don't know how. I was on this end of the couch, and she was standing over there at the end. And I, I still, to this day, I don't have any idea how I got there as fast as I did. He was facing that way, and she was standing at his tail. She reached out to touch him, and he just swung around like that. Whoo, and he was going to snap at her face. I mean, he's right at that level, same height, and just, whoom. There's a half pit, half lab mix. So all these people that say pits are good, I'm like, I don't care what they say. I don't trust them. I don't care. You argue whatever you want. Yours is the greatest dog ever. I don't care. Okay, that dog almost ate my daughter's face and it got a bullet in the head. That's what I know, okay? But anyway, I jumped across and I just smacked that dog in the face and I grabbed his collar and I jerked him up like that and threw him outside and he had to stay with us for a few days until uh, I had time off of work and I could take him out to the mesa and you know, give him, some, feed him some lead. But that's what ended up happening. But I'm not going to keep that dog around. That's what we do with sin. So we'll just give him another chance. He didn't mean to. What if he makes it worse? Right. What if he gets her next time? Why would I leave that danger near me? So why do we do that with sin? Why do we just allow it to hang around? Why do we allow for those things? I'm telling you, the most dangerous area in our lives today is right here. Amen. There's so much evil that come about on these. So much the pull of Egypt that comes out on these that draws us. And it's an open door and it's the devil saying, come on, come on. It's okay. Don't worry. No one sees Nobody's going to know. No one knows what you're looking at. Nobody knows who you're talking to. No one knows what's said. You can delete it. It's all right. Look, if you're deleting stuff on here, you're not right with God. Why do you have to delete it? Why? If you have to delete text messages or pictures, Look, unless you're planning a surprise birthday party, all right, I'll give you that. If you're planning a surprise birthday party, you got to go ahead, all right? 
But if, if that's not happening, shame on you. Shame on you. I can grab my kids' phones at any time and look at what's on their phone. It, it is, it's not theirs. Right. So they, they have their own privacy. No, they don't. Amen. No, they don't. Yeah, that's right. Don't make that mistake. You just kick the door open and ask the devil. Hey, come on in, devil. Come, here's my child. Can I lead you to their room? Come on, here they are. That's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. What carefulness it wrought in you. We may need to change some things in our homes. And look, if some of you are going to buck against it, that just shows where your heart's at. Look, if the changes start being made, if dad comes home and says, this isn't going to go like this anymore, or your friends, you come, come around your friends and they're like, what are you doing? How come, why aren't you doing this anymore? You know, hey, separate from them. Right. Separate from them. Leave them. Look, I'm telling you. We just, I think it was last Saturday, I think it was, went to my nephew's uh, graduation party. And I saw a lot of family that I love. And I enjoyed seeing them. But the three hours we were there is about all it can be. I can't spend more time with them. Why? Because even while we were there, the drinking's getting to be more and more, and it's like, all right, we got to go. We got to go. And I miss them and love them dearly, but I can't be around that. Right. I don't want my kids around that. Amen. I'm not going to tolerate that. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yeah. It may cost you family. It may cost you friends. But who do you love more, God Amen. or your own self and what you want? Look, I'm telling you right now, if, if some changes start happening in your home and you buck against them, you just revealed your heart. You spilled your heart out to everybody. You spilled your heart to everyone where you are at. Look, and, I, and I'm, I'm just telling you right now from a father's perspective, man, there's a lot of decisions I have to make. I don't want to do it. Right. That I fight. And I try and justify and I try and excuse why not to do it. Because I know the battle that's going to ensue in my home. Even if it's a silent battle. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? If it's a silent battle by your kid, just... And go, go and do it anyway, but inside there, man, inside there, just like that little toddler that says, I'm not sitting down. I may be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm standing here. That's what I'm talking about. That's what, that silent battle that you know is there. You know it's brewing. You're waiting maybe for something, for some time for it to blow up. Right. For it to just explode. There's a lot of times I'm like, I'm sick of being the bad guy. I'm tired of being the bad guy. But somebody has to. Because I'm not going to let the devil in. I'm not going to let the devil in. Someone has to. Wives, help your husband. Stand with him. Stand with him. When he puts his foot down on something, help him, encourage him. Tell him, I'm right with you, honey. Let's go. Let's do this. When you know something's going to have to happen, stand with him, encourage him, because I'm telling you right now, he don't want to do it. He doesn't. But it has to if we're going to keep the devil out. And amen, as much as I don't want to be, I will be the bad guy. And I do not want to be, but I will be. Where are we going to stand? What carefulness it wrought in you? Are we going to allow that to, to help us change some things, to fix some things that need to be fixed? That's what, what has to take place. We're all in different circumstances. We're all in different situations. I get that. But true repentance ought to bring some, some carefulness. It ought to rot some carefulness in us. Make that, build that thing up in us that we're, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, watch out. What is that? We're careful. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. It's talking about worry. It says, don't worry about this type of stuff. Not, not this here, but don't worry about things. Take it to God in prayer. So if you're, if you're careful for something, you're worried. You say, watch out, watch out. So in this regard, it brought carefulness in you. God says, this is a good thing in this sense when you're watching out for sin, when you're walking circumspect. You're looking on all sides. You're, you're living like the devil's actually a roaring lion seeking to devour you. What carefulness it wrought in you. I don't want that coming back in. 
This is what the Corinthian church did. They said, no, no, we're not going to have that sin come back in. We kicked it out. We dealt with that thing. We're going to be on watch for that now. We're not going to allow that again. We're not going to tolerate uh, wickedness, leaven, to come into this church body and destroy it. Because it almost killed that church, I guarantee it. There was already divisions happening all over the place because they were tolerating sin. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It'll spread into all sorts of sin when we allow some sin. There's no telling where it's at if we don't put a stop to it. We have to put a stop to it. It rocked carefulness. Whoa, 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 what's going on right there? What is that? Hey, hey, hey. Oh, let me see. Where, where's that phone? Let me see what you're looking at on there. Let me see. Come here. Let me see that. Yep. Husbands and wives, man, you're, this ought to be open to your spouse. Anytime. Let me see your phone, honey. Over here. And I'll joke with my wife. I'm like, oh, hold on, hold on. Pretend like I'm messing with something. But here, oh, now yeah, you can look at it. But no, anytime. She can grab it anytime. Nothing to hide. No, you're hiding a birthday gift or something, anniversary gift. But other than that, you should have nothing you're hiding. What carefulness it wrought in you. Say, I just don't, I love you too much to let these dangers destroy you. I love you all too much to let these dangers destroy us. Can I put it like this without, you know, getting too self-focused, but I love myself too much in the sense that I want a good walk with God and I want to be close to God too much to allow these things in. I want to be careful about what I allow to come in. What I've, As I've repented of some things and gotten things right, I'm going to be careful in that area. I'm going to guard this and guard this and I'm going to shut that door and shut this door. Close the window over here because I don't want these things getting into me. You know what your natural weaknesses are. Every one of us does. We know where we naturally fall and stumble. So be careful. Let true repentance rot a carefulness in you in those areas. We'll finish the rest of this tonight. Let's pray.